Um, I need really to start with a confession, I think. And that is um, that I was listening to Dan Siddell's uh, very moving words today when he suggested that we really need to take James Elkin's warning um, to heart about how we go about these conversations, to take them slowly and carefully. And I believe in that wholeheartedly. The only trouble is it's not my style. <laughs> my style is more, I'm afraid, brash, more than I want it to be, <laughs> emotional, and I'm likely to commit heresies on both the side of contemporary art and religion before I'm through. <laughs> Because, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, and it's, it's really because I'm one of those art historians just slowly starting to become more self-reflexive about my own secular institutions, blind spots where religion is concerned. So I wanna take this opportunity to sincerely, right, sincerely <laughs> thank, and I mean that without any postmodern irony. <laughs> I do, <laughs> I do, really. Um, to sincerely thank Biola University for this invitation, and especially for leading me to James Elkin's book, because it has set my mind spiraling in a million directions, as you can soon see. All right, so um, let's start appropriately with a vision. Caspar David Friedrich's vision, to be exact, of a crucifixion on a mountaintop, illuminated by an otherworldly light that comes from a beyond. We can see clearly the heavy, inert weight of the material, physical world of nature, the, that rocky slope and those evergreens pointing toward the turbulent, sublime heavens overhead. Caspar David Friedrich gives us a solid perch in this world through his detailed foregrounds, but he draws our vision into the background depths where everything loses its solidity and materiality, where all matter becomes spirit. The surprising thing is how he gives us no middle ground. The middle ground drops out completely, and we can only enter the scene by making an out-of-body leap into the light, into the transcendent beyond. Caspar David Friedrich is an artist in love with long distances. And he frames the scene where nature meets the supernatural with a shimmering gold architectural structure filled with symbolic iconography, including the all-seeing eye of God mounted in a pyramid below. Now, a website used at Boston College discusses this painting called The Touch and Altar of 1807, declaring, quote, for the first time in Christian art, an altarpiece was conceived in terms of a pure landscape. The cross, viewed obliquely from behind, is an insignificant element in the composition. More important are the dominant rays of the evening sun, which the artist said depicted the setting of the old, pre-Christian world. The mountain symbolizes an immovable faith, while the fir trees are an allegory of hope." End quote. Now, I find two things ironic here. According to the official art historical blurb, the cross is, a, is an insignificant element in the composition. It is curious and perhaps telling that the author seems more certain of what the mountain and fir trees symbolize than what the purpose of the cross might possibly be. I find it equally ironic that I turn to this image from 1807, which in the artist's own words, marked the setting of the old pre-Christian world and thus heralded in the dawning of a new Christian age, to begin a talk that marks the setting of what is now perceived as an old, Christian-filled, iconographical world that stands at a critical distance or removed from, from the, a contemporary art world that no longer shares its <coughs> transcendent vision. Oops, back, back. <laughs> 160 years later, we find ourselves in a black hole world where there is no sign of nature, where the light has grown cold and sharp, with a graphic edge borrowed from advertising and commercial design, cutting through the now long horizontal expanse taken directly from movie screen formats and technicolor glory, complete with crane shot and artificial spotlights to illuminate our cinematic dreams. The 20th Century Fox logo has taken the place of the 
Logos, the moment when the word was flesh and the sign was full. Now there is nothing behind it. Pop artist Ed Ruscha, who was raised a Catholic and taught by nuns, has cut off the beyond, leaving us with nothing but a free floating signifier. What once was a divine light is now all too profane, nothing but special effects and movie magic. Not only is God missing here, but there is no sign of the human either, wiped out by that slick airbrushed surface. But could I even talk about this work as the presence of an absence, unless it somehow conjured up the ghost image of a Friedrich? of a time when light could be the bearer of a divine presence, a time when the sign was full, the word was flesh, and there were hidden depths and the promise of transcendence. Now, no one would mistake this pop anti-icon as a religious painting, but in a sense, does it not pick up where James Elkin's book leaves off with the idea of a negative theology, or at least, a deconstructive, negating turn, which leaves us with no positive affirmation, but with the presence of an absence. Now, that may seem like an end point, but I see it as a starting point. In the words of beat poet Allen Ginsberg, no work that shows, that shows its own emptiness is empty. If there is one thing that contemporary art shows us again and again, it is that Elvis has left the building and taking God with him. So where does that leave us? What is the strange place of the human in contemporary art? And what light might the human condition shed on the place of God and religion in contemporary art? After all, weren't we supposedly made in his image? When you reach out to touch someone, <laughs> notice how we cannot get back to the logos because everything we say already seems to have been turned into a cliche or an advertising jingle. We can only connect to a disconnect. Has God become an extraterrestrial? Is there no way for him to phone home to the contemporary artist? Still, I have to admit that I get messages from outer space all the time. We all do. It's called email. <laughs> I got one just the other day when I was in the midst of working on this very talk. I was just about to delete it like a reflex reaction when I noticed who sent it. Theologian 62. <laughs> My finger froze on the mouse pad. Was it a message from God? No. It was yet another annoying ad for Viagra. But this one I didn't erase because it seemed too timely, coming from theologian 62 just two days before I was to speak at Biola University. <laughs> I decided to look more carefully at it for a sign, any sign of a coded message. I wondered, and still wonder, if it was just a typo or whether we should read it as God is disorder glorious? Because then the plot thickens. From the point of view of contemporary art, we could say that God is disorder glorious. Certainly contemporary art has a God problem, especially because the glory of God and religion were such centralizing, ordering concepts for artists in the past. Whether they personally were faithful believers or not, artists found in religion a solid foundation for a symbolic system of iconography and a foundation not only for spiritual focus but for social order as well. There was no need to separate a private, personally defined spiritual realm from a public religious faith tied to church institutions and ritual since the two were seen as intrinsically linked as were all things within the one all-encompassing substance that is God, or at least Spinoza's idea of God. By 1899, when Freud made us conscious of the unconscious, it was fast becoming apparent that a line was starting to be drawn between the surface and depth of knowledge. And this is when truth 
goes underground, when the surface of things begins to seem superficial, and when truth and knowledge become equated with inner depth. Hence, mimetic art forms that imitate the surface appearance of things no longer seem to be addressing the truth of things. And this is precisely the kind of intellectual paradigm shift necessary for the birth of abstraction. Remember the title of Kandinsky's first book, written as a validation of abstraction, concerning the spiritual in art. Instead of addressing the material, physical universe of things and particular types, Abstraction is what cuts straight to the underlying universal laws of the cosmos. As Kandinsky put it with such conviction, the object, it harms my painting. It is the spirit that rules over matter and not the other way around. Meanwhile, Nietzsche is proclaiming God is dead and Kierkegaard is saying that it no longer suffices to simply follow the herd to church every Sunday if one is to lead a truly religious life. God has to become a leap of faith, not based on reason, but on a set of deeply internalized values. Defining religious life purely through the individual relationship one has with God means for Kierkegaard that the church is seen merely as an outer shell of religious rituals played out in a public way on the surface. In his mind, membership in the church becomes the very antithesis of being a Christian. Now, if God becomes privatized in a modern world and religion becomes personally spiritualized, what happens to an age of iconography? A discursive system of readable symbols and codes. It becomes disordered, decentered, fragmented, and discursive on multiple levels rather than socially cohesive and coherent. In the loss of an all-encompassing holistic oneness that is God, we end up with something much closer to postmodern complexity. But perhaps the prophecy of my email message can still hold true, and we can discover a way to think of God within contemporary art as disorder glorious. That is where this talk, spurred on by James Elkins, uh, Elkins' provocative book, is heading. But for now, as the message says, we are as low as you can get. Pills and drugs as the fix-all answer for anything from extra weight to mood swings altering mind as well as body. Welcome to the post-human condition where you just need to get plugged in. The term and these graphics came from a contemporary art exhibit mounted in 1992, but the term has circulated in a broader discourse um, than merely that of art for some time now and refers to questions about how Western capitalist and technologically advanced societies may well be creating a new kind of post-human person, replacing previous constructions of the self. This is not just sci-fi. We may well be the last of the purely human generation, since we are all already in phase transition toward becoming cyborg. Just check your pacemakers or just your hearing aids, or try to imagine writing any serious paper without a computer, if you are wondering how this could possibly be so. And while we're at it, how many of you have a dog with an ID chip implanted in its neck? We have three at home. <laughs> now, only if I could get a chip implanted in my husband, it's only a matter of time. <laughs> Within the next 30 years, the fear that we may not be able to distinguish real humans from replicants will no longer be just science fiction. Maybe that time has already come. <laughs> <laughs> Cyborg. The word conjures up sci-fi images of half-human, half-machine monsters with computers for brains and flesh as cover. They move about amongst us, but they are not us. They're not human, but they hunt human women, not for killing, for mating. <laughs> Don't worry, the women aren't human either. <laughs> An encounter with a cyborg does not usually end well. One of us, it would seem, has got to go. In this human versus machine scenario, 
What is replaced, what's replayed over and over again is a fundamental distrust of technology, coupled with a fear of losing what makes us most human. Compared to the tough metallic shell of a machine, aren't our bodies of flesh and blood all too vulnerable? Compared to a machine's efficient programming, vast storage banks, accelerated processing skills, don't our fragile psyches, faulty memories, unruly desires, and weak wills make us seem unreliable and, let's face it, just hopelessly out of date? Is our fear thus that we humans have become obsolete, that we could be replaced, that soon it will no longer be possible to tell where the human ends and the machine begins? Thank goodness we're only talking about the movies. Such sci-fi fears are surely a long way off in the future. Cyborgs do not live amongst us, or do they? Meet the Gubernator. <laughs> Arnold is a good case in point. He's a bodybuilder turned action movie hero turned Terminator turned governor of the state of California. <laughs> With his bulging pecs <laughs> and unreal tan, he hardly seems natural. Many critics felt, <laughs> many critics felt, <laughs> I had to choose these two, there were plenty to choose from. Many critics felt his acting reached its zenith in The Terminator, where the role did not require that he exhibit an extensive range of human emotions or say much more than, I'll be back. And he certainly did come back not only in Terminators 2 and 3, but in the California recall race as well. It was always difficult to kill the Terminator. He was the thing that kept coming back from the dead, and he was the thing that defined cyborg in popular culture terms. Arnold on the outside, robot on the inside. He seemed half human, half machine, but all intimidating. Even more menacing was the fact that he kept coming back to life after being crashed, crushed, and burned. The Terminator was dead as well as alive, touching very close to our deepest, darkest cyborg fears that what is human in us will die. But we will live on as something else, something other, something monstrous. I would like to make the claim that the Terminator has given cyborgs a bad rap. First of all, the Terminator is not even a cyborg. He is merely a robot disguised by a simulated flesh outer cover. He is a trompe l'oeil cyborg at best a fake. He isn't half machine, he is all machine. And cyborgs are never all any one thing. A cyborg is always a hybrid. Being half human, half machine is not a necessary condition for being a cyborg, though that is exactly what one would conclude from the Terminator. The moral? Never leave it to a robot to explain what a cyborg is. Ask Donna Haraway, author of the Cyborg Manifesto. According to Haraway, a cyborg exists when two kinds of boundaries are simultaneously problematic. Oh, I don't know, like religion and art? Um, Specifically, though, for the cyborg, the boundary between animals and humans, like on the left, and the boundary between self-controlled, self-governing machines, automatons, and humans, like on the right. The cyborg is a figure born of the interface. A cybernetic organism operates at the boundary crossing of two seemingly incompatible systems. Out of this merging comes an emerging of a new complex system that cannot be reduced to its separate parts, but that also resists forming a higher synthesis in which a unified, undifferentiated whole, traditionally thought of as the oneness of God, reigns supreme. The complex systems of cyborgs are impossible to pin down and classify precisely because they always break down into being not wholly this, but not wholly that either. After all, the editors of the Cyborg Handbook inform us, the cyborg lives only through the symbiosis of ostensible opposites, always in tension. Cyborgology, thus, goes beyond dualistic epistemologies or binary thinking. The Cyborg Handbook defines the epistemology of the cyborg as thesis, antithesis, synthesis, prosthesis. 
It is this prosthetic dimension of the cyborg that we need to further extend, precisely because it points to the possibilities of extension that cyborgs offer. Possibilities, I would add, that far outnumber the potential problems of cyborgs, which is what the apocalyptic doomsday tone of sci-fi movies must typically uh, predict. Why should our bodies end at the skin, asks Donna Haraway. In an age when plastic surgery has made it seem natural to redesign oneself, when the human genome has been decoded and cloning plus designer evolution are no longer mere science fiction, but within our technological grasp, it is the question of the post-human that makes a rethinking of the humanist tradition and its current connect or disconnect from God seem so pressing for the arts. Contemporary art may be wary of tackling religion directly, but there are artists addressing the challenge of the post-human. Orlan went through a series of surgeries in an effort to redesign herself, but it is easy to distinguish her from the rest of us so-called real humans. She is the one with implants in her forehead. Calling herself Saint Orlan, she designed her own surgeries. Had haute couture uniforms made for the surgical team, and televised the whole procedure while she read out loud from books on theory. The reality was not so pretty, which is perhaps a part of what these art performances were about. Here we see her during her evolution toward becoming art. It didn't take the fashion world long to catch on. Now you too can have Orlan's implanted brow, like these models from Belgium, who display prosthetic versions of what she went under the knife to achieve. Orlan has resisted commercializing her art when asked to design surgeries for wealthy patrons. She declined, saying that was not what her body alterations were about. The Chapman brothers in England give us an even more disturbing peek at our all-too-human fears of cloning run amok. It is back to the garden, but with designer evolution quickly becoming devolution in a, wor in a world where God has been replaced by a not so intelligent design. The Australian-based performance artist Stellark would argue that we are on the way to evolving a higher state. No artist has probably pushed the human-machine interface more than Stellark to the point that the body has, in his own words, become obsolete. He feels our physiology limits the scope of our philosophy. For Stellark, it is about being able to open up and interface with the environment without bodily limitations. He desires, quote, a body that is directly wired into the net, a kind of phantom body made of fractal flesh, a body that quivers and oscillates to the ebb and flow of net activity. The body, he warns, must become immortal to adapt. That time is near if you believe Ray Kurzweil who wrote The Age of Spiritual Machines, and more recently its sequel, The Singularity is Near. Kurzweil takes an optimistic fast-forward look into a not-so-distant future in which artificial intelligence accelerates to a degree far surpassing the human mind. Rather than predicting doomsday, he dubs this new technological era the Age of Singularity, when the universe itself will acquire the kind of higher consciousness traditionally associated with God. For Kurzweil, God the Creator was not there in the beginning, but unlike Godot, he does arrive late on the scene in the form of a singularity that is near infinite in, it, in its expanse. Kurzweil predicts a new civilization will evolve, enabling us to transcend our biological limitations and amplify our creativity in the process. In this brave new world, there will be no clear distinction between human and machine, real reality and virtual reality. Human aging and illness will be reversed. Nanotechnology will not only make it possible to virtually create the physical, it will ultimately conquer the problem of death itself. Now, from my vantage point in 2008, the age of singularity still sounds a long way off, or suspiciously like it already happened a long time ago. In Spinoza's concept of God as one substance, a supreme singularity, encompassing everything infinite within its fold, or Hegel's idea that all of human history is progressing toward a universal consciousness. 
Kurzweil's utopia, without pollution, poverty, or hunger, is strangely nostalgic of that long ago garden, that paradise, before we ate that apple, before we acquired a different kind of all too human consciousness. Today, we're not that innocent, to quote Britney Spears. All I can see in the offing is gasoline for $4 a gallon. I don't see the age of singularity. We find ourselves caught between a world of Christian iconography fading out of view and a utopian vision of a technological transcendence, the age of spiritual machines and a singularity of intelligence that frankly seems way beyond our intelligence to pull off. So where does that leave us now in the troubled present? The German artist Gerhard Richter makes a painting of Titian's Annunciation, but he can only paint it by unpainting it. The visionary is eclipsed by the blur. It starts to fade out like a Rothko, but even a Rothko seems to speak of more faith than the skeptical Richter can muster. The critic Robert Hughes once said that if Rothko had lived in an age of iconography, meaning an age in which the sign was full, he might have been a great religious painter. He did not live in such an age. But we still talk about the kind of light Rothko could wrench from color as if it has a mystical aura. We still talk about a Rothko moment as if it were the afterglow of a Friedrich sunset. But Rothko was painting in 1950, the end of World War II. By 1980, the end of the 20th century, we questioned whether it was still possible to paint Rothko's light, let alone Friedrich's. Ross Blechner gives us a different kind of light, colder, vibrating, more twitchy, like Rothko having a nervous breakdown. Blechner called stripe paintings like this schizoid because they hover between a transcendent light and a fluorescent bulb. While the only way they can reference a spiritual light is obliquely by referencing a Rothko, they also relate to the failure of op art, which could not see beyond the purely visual. The painting also owes something to pop art and its day glow colors that are not about an inner light, but more about a vision turned outward to the world around one. The result is Rothko goes Vegas. As Blechner says, quote, essentially I'm degrading the sublime. Painting in the 80s, Blechner feels he cannot put blinders on. He cannot simply shut himself up in the studio and paint mystical abstractions. His work hovers between a transcendent light and ironic disillusionment, between a light that pulls us into its mysterious dark depths but keeps us shut out on the surface. Up close, those ghostly orbs of light become just what they are, globs of paint. Can you transcend with paint? Blechner makes his own pigments in an attempt at alchemy, but he knows full well that the idea of saying, quote, I believe in painting is meaningless. The idea of saying, or just to say I believe in painting and then take the stuff and move it around doesn't prove anything, he tells us. The smell of paint is great, but it doesn't make meaning. Belief in painting can be camouflage, a fear of ideas. I don't want painting to be just an activity which camouflages. Now what is it that he does not want to camouflage? Blechner is an openly gay artist and was painting these haunting canvases during the early AIDS crisis. He was not only dealing with the so-called death of painting during the 1980s period of post-studio art in which theory ruled, but also he was dealing with the actual death of many friends in his community. Abstraction as a form of mystifying the real world or real world concerns would not be ethical. Far from being a vehicle of spiritual transcendence, abstraction and its claim to spiritual transcendence needed to be transcended. For Blechner, it is important to be a witness to one's own time. Remember me. Those are the words the painting whispers from between the lines. These paintings are memento mori imagery, both for those who died of AIDS and for the death of painting itself. Blechner conjures up a mystical light and then blocks transcendence on the surface when light reverts back to a buildup of paint. It is a strange form of spiritual materialism. We are locked out, barred from entry. As Peter Haley said of these works, quote, 
They convey a mood of questioning and a realization relatively novel in Western civilization that knowledge may be doubt and that doubt may be light, that the reality of disillusionment may offer the possibility of transcendence. This is, an, is in a way, about a kind of ending. And if all religion on some level is about death, then perhaps these are a form of religious paintings in that burning away sense that Elkins identifies. They certainly are about emptying out. Blechner said, the 20th century trend has been to empty out assumptions about art and the making of art. Ad Reinhardt, for example, is the quintessential deconstructivist in painting. He certainly emptied out abstraction. The irony of emptying out is that things shine with a maximum brilliance just before they die. Ad Reinhardt is Blechner's favorite artist. He devoted the last 15 years of his life to painting nothing but black paintings, saying, I'm just making the last paintings which anyone can make. I'm wearing my Ad Reinhardt skirt for you. <laughs> the important thing is the painting out, he says. If you want to be left with nothing, you can't have nothing to begin with. You can only make something by taking things apart. The question is, what are you left with? These slides are deceptive. You really have to sit in front of these. The black is so, if you've seen them, he can sink a black. He can sink it back until it becomes purple, but you have to give them time. And what in our world today really asks you to give it time? These works ask a lot of you. Is there a cross embedded in all that blackness? Or is it merely a black hole? Do we see something? Or are we left waiting for Godot? And what if Godot showed up after all? What would the second coming be like? Catholic boy and gay artist Dwayne Michaels gives us a parable of Christ's visit to New York in 1982. Christ sees a woman who has died during an illegal abortion. Christ eats dog food with an old Ukrainian lady in Brooklyn. Christ is beaten defending a homosexual. Christ sees a woman being attacked. Christ is shot by a mugger with a handgun and dies. The second coming had occurred and no one noticed. The 19th century pictorial photographer F. Holland Day staged a second coming of sorts by photographing the crucifixion, complete with a model playing Christ fastened to the cross, to the cross with ropes and scantily clad Roman soldiers draped at his feet. Photography's connection to the all too real greatly undercuts such an attempt at the divine, reeling it for the artificiality, the contrived soft core porn, um, theatrical image that it is. Friedrich could get away with the sublime much better in painting, but can painting still pull it off? This is Friedrich's wreck of the ship Hope. You can see the ship way over on the right. One jagged, um, you, there's really, the human traces are, are just dwarfed by the sublime powers of nature here. One jagged chunk of ice forms a tombstone for those buried in this frozen sea. But Richter, another German artist painting nearly 200 years later, finds that fog has settled in. We can't even see the tip of the iceberg any longer. Friedrich's eerie monk by the seashore of 1808 speaks of the sublime as an infinite vision, as if one's eyelids had been cut off and one could see without any blinders on. But Richter's seascape, an echo of Friedrich's, differs in one crucial respect. There is no longer any human presence, let alone a godly presence. And then the clouds roll in, obscuring any view into a beyond. Where the sea meets the horizon, where our eye goes to find the light, we see that instead of sea meeting sky, the sea meets only itself. The heavens were just a mirage. Richter does give us moments of the sublime, though we find them infrequently and in all the wrong places, like a burst of transcendent light illuminating a toilet paper roll. Maybe the light we've been looking for is still possible, but the sacred is no longer part of the religious iconography of the past. It is instead found, perhaps, in the spectacle of the everyday. 
Painting is the one thing that Richter seems to still believe in. A painting, he tells us, can help us to think something that goes beyond the senseless existence. That's something art can do. But even so, his method of painting is to unpaint. He starts by painting a canvas and squeegeeing it. It is as if painting had gone the way of religion, neither being anything a contemporary artist can still do directly without deconstructing or undoing on some level. The results are beautiful, but a stubborn sp spiritual materialism lingers. The artist Hans Hoffmann once said, paint, holy paint. When all other affirmations are emptied out, we still are left with paint. And paint maybe can still speak. In fact, maybe it can't help but speak, even if only of our doubt and questioning in the end. But Richter's paintings speak a different language from much of what passes as religious art today. If a painting does display an iconography having to do with religion or the church, is that sufficient for it to be considered authentically religious? You be the judge. Certainly, these pastoral paintings of churches are pretty. There can be no doubt of that, though pretty is not a word used much in college art course critiques or gallery reviews. But one has to wonder if these paintings are not merely scenic landscapes with a church rather than religious paintings, especially when we see how formulaic they are. And they do follow a formula. Note the way the steeple is supposed to lift you high to the heavens, or is that a Disneyland backdrop? The light in these paintings is surprisingly secular for a sacred subject. What illuminates them is an abundance of electric lights which reveal well-manicured lawns and impeccable gardening. Everything is in order here. Everything is clearly coded, down to the burst of rays from the setting sun. Where have we seen that before? Oh, yes, <laughs> Friedrich. Thomas Kincaid seems to be saying, one more time, and with feeling. <laughs> but he has missed a crucial point. He not only details the foreground, but the background as well, and he assures a safe passage by painting in a detailed middle ground. That is where he parts company with Friedrich, whose painting can only be accessed by that leap of faith from foreground to the inner depths. But Kincaid knows how to follow the light. In this painting of a soldier titled Heading Home, he has no trouble beaming up by accessing the light that Richter could only unpaint. In place of Richter's blur, we get readable, detailed insignia, so there can be no doubt, and so there will only be reassurance. This is the opposite of negative theology. It is nothing but positive affirmations, and yet somehow I am left thinking the sublime has been degraded here. Maybe it is the fact that the image belongs to a category called inspirational, which just seems too easy. There are a few overtly religious-themed paintings in this category, religious-themed, I say, but what I was struck by was both how varied and the same the inspirational paintings are. The painting Sunrise with its crucifixion meets its double in America's pride, as religious inspiration is equated with national pride. And the light of freedom is almost an exact match for America's pride. The inspirational category also contains Sweetheart Gazebo and the Garden of Prayer, where the same picturesque features are used interchangeably to reference both romantic and religious inspiration. You really start thinking you are seeing double when virtually the only thing that separates some of the scenes are the titles, Pool of Serenity on the left and the Garden of Prayer still on the right. All of these works are included in the inspirational series, Pathways to Paradise, Bridge of Faith, The Prince of Peace, and The Garden of Prayer. What do they all hold in common? They are all sold out. <laughs> Thomas Kincaid leaves us with this inspirational scene titled Almost Heaven. I would add, not quite. Friedrich knows that transcendence requires that leap, that out-of-body experience, that doubt, which is a kind of faith. When Friedrich was a young boy, he was playing on the ice. He fell through to the icy waters below. His brother jumped in and saved him, but his brother ended up drowning in the process. Friedrich expresses that yearning to leave this world behind. Kincaid's works seem quite comfortable, even smugly so, in this world. They may never make it into art world galleries, but he does have his own chain of commercial galleries, and business on the net is good. All is well in his world. 
Perhaps that gray matter of doubt and questioning are necessary ingredients of contemporary art's relation to religion. The more I looked at the so-called secular or agnostic imagery of much of contemporary art, like Jasper John's disappearance on the right, I couldn't help but see that presence of an absence again and again, which is where the question of God remains so powerfully poignant and echoing throughout, like Blechner's submerged whisper, remember me. John's may cut off any access to a beyond, but there is no way to read the image without thinking of a beyond. John's would not have liked my reading of the presence of an absence in his work. He once said, that would imply that there was something there to start with. Is there something there in all that gray matter? I would like to end today by following Elkin's example, by telling you the story of one of my students. James has been watching a lot of TV lately, not American Idol, or other so-called reality shows. He is watching a different kind of reality, the kind you see on a television screen when the programming has gone off and you are left with the static, that flickering snow of an untuned screen. James begins at that seeming dead end with television snow, which looks very much as if there were nothing there, as if there were no there there. The truth is that there is a density of information overload in television snow, but in an unfocused state. Approximately 1% of this noise is the effect of residual electromagnetic waves left over from the formation of the universe. These qualities make it an appropriating starting place for exploring visual aspects of form and formlessness, James wrote in his master's thesis. I use both visual and auditory elements of noise as raw material for one line of work that explores altered states of perception and consciousness and the brain's inherent tendencies to enter these states. Images of analog um, video snow are captured and then digitally manipulated by James. He then outprints the work in large scale so the resulting image will be truly immersive. As the poet Yeats said, the center no longer holds. Mere chaos is loosed upon the world. With nothing to hold on to, no anchoring or focal point, we get lost. But that is precisely when we start to find things. This is a detail. The imagery may read like visual noise. But there is a great tipping point when noise becomes information. This is one of the rules of complex systems. There must be noise in the system for adaptation and new emergences to occur. There must be interactions and loops in the interactions, feedback, making for a nonlinear dynamics. Complex systems are open systems that operate under conditions far from equilibrium. Individual elements are ignorant of the behavior of the whole system in which they are embedded, meaning a small interaction here can have a large ripple effect elsewhere, and there is no one controlling element or hierarchy. In other words, complexity, true complexity that is not merely complicated, adds up to a non-totalizing whole. This is where it gets interesting. Has James found his way to a new singularity amidst all this television snow? Has he accessed a technological sublime? Does snow start to emerge as a complex system? After writing about art, architecture, and religion, the theologian Mark C. Taylor has more recently turned to complexity theory, questioning the fundamental belief that God is one or oneness is God. Quote, if ultimate reality is one, he tells us, simplicity is epistemologically truer and ontologically more real than complexity. From this point of view, to remain entangled in the complexities of life is to be trapped in a world of error and illusion. Obviously, the religious belief in simplicity does not die easily. Indeed, for many people, the more complex the world becomes, the more they long for simplicity. But things are never simple, or never merely simple. Complexity, we are discovering, is inescapable. Taylor reminds us that complexity comes from the Latin complexus, which means to entwine together and that the suffix plex means to fold. Complexity then is formed by interweaving, interconnecting, and folding together different parts, elements, or components. While Kurzweil's notion of singularity may seem the opposite of Mark C. Taylor's embrace of complexity theory, there is a point where the two collapse in on one another, and that is at the juncture of defining what kind of holistic vision opens up at the event horizon. Both singularity and complexity point to non-totalizing structures that nonetheless act as a whole, which is potentially the point of reconciliation between the postmodern fragmentation and diversity that characterizes so much of the contemporary art world 
and the godlike concept of a oneness that is now emerging as closer to the nonlinear dynamics of a complex system. As for my student James, he started these works while trying to work through the most painful experience of his life. After being accepted at the Chicago Art Institute, where he undoubtedly would have been James Elkin's student, he decided to stay and do graduate work at Long Beach State so he could marry the girl of his dreams. I went to the wedding. There wasn't a dry eye in the house, but it, it wasn't simply tears of happiness, though it was that too. It was because James' bride had a terminal illness. None of us knew that it would be over so quick. She turned for the worse on their honeymoon. They only had a month together. James did not do any art for some time. Then he started tuning in to TV Snow. The question of whether there is a beyond or whether we simply project one onto this digital snow is the complex threshold between order and chaos, form and formlessness that he is investigating. He would not call these works religious. He is as skeptical as he is drawn to the light. His work falls into Elkin's category of an unconscious religion, perhaps, but the more I think about that, he's just way too sophisticated. He's way too tuned in to what he's doing for it to be that. But it is a very good example, I think, of what Elkins calls a postmodern sublime. That point at which the romantic sublime seems to break down, rather than being a source of release or transcendence. But there is another kind of breakthrough into complexity, into the recognition of a non-totalizing whole, where all the various parts are unfolded like the densely packed information of flickering snow on an untuned screen. God is disorder glorious. Just as my email had prophesied, Perhaps we can't beam up from here, but perhaps we can find some common meeting ground between religion and contemporary art if we start thinking of God as a non-totalizing system and begin treating religion as well as art and reality as enriching examples of complexity that do not need solving or resolving so much as unfolding and adaptation to provide possibilities for more extensive feedback and new emergences. I do not want complexity theory here at my conclusion to seem like merely an example of deus ex machina, God lowered down from the machine, indicating an unexpected artificial or improbable device introduced suddenly to resolve a dramatic situation or untangle a plot. Let us not forget that true complexity never simplifies anything, least of all a tale of the human and God, religion and art, in a time of cyborgs, complexity, Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> I'm off. I'm hitting my buttons. Let's go back there. In a time of cyborgs, complexity, and non-totalizing holes. He couldn't wait to get out. We started with a vision. We end with one. Is it the face of God? When we peer closer, the image breaks down, and we see that the hole is made up of a great number of barcodes in close-range interaction with no awareness of the greater complexity in which they are implicated. Let us not forget the strange place of the human in all this. You can buy the barcode Jesus t-shirt. <laughs> Is nothing sacred anymore? Thank you.